Volatility, uncertainty, complexity. This is the work environment that is our reality. What will leaders need to know to be successful in the future? Who will they need to be to build team member commitment? How will they need to show up to create a motivating environment for their people? Welcome to the Sal Sylvester on the Future of Leadership podcast, a dialogue about how leaders will need to adapt to be successful in a rapidly changing world. And now, please join your host and executive producer, Sal Sylvester, to engage in the conversation about the future of leadership and how to transform people into confident leaders. Hello, listeners. This is Sal Sylvester from 512 Solutions. We're executive coaching leadership development firm based in Boulder, Colorado. It is awesome to be with you today. As many of you know, if you heard my introduction to this podcast, we're here to explore the future of work and what that means for the future of leadership. And as our society and our world is changing around us, what does that mean for leaders? As the complexity of our businesses and our organization only increases, who will leaders need to be and how will they have to show up to be successful in the future? And that's where my curiosity lies as an executive coach and leadership development facilitator. So I'm excited to be in that place of inquiry with you, my listeners and guests, to explore what the future of leadership looks like. Our guest today is Vaughn Ray. Vaughn is a global IT executive, and he's been in software development his entire career. He's currently in a role where he manages teams across North America, Eastern Europe, Western Europe and India. And I've had the opportunity to know Vaughn for a long time. I've had the opportunity to work with him when he was an executive at Staples. And he's one of the most forward thinking strategic leaders that I've ever met. I think he has a lot to offer. He's got an especially a, a deep knowledge and expertise in implementing agile methodologies in global work environments. So uh, in this interview with Vaughn, I think you're gonna be surprised to hear about his perspective on failure and why it's important in the workplace. Let's go to the interview now. Vaughn, welcome to the show today. How are you? Good, how are you, Sal? It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, Vaughn, I think one of the things that I've really always admired about you as a leader and as a person, and we've had the opportunity to work together in the past, is you're, you, you're always thinking ahead. I think you're a very forward-looking leader and strategic in your thinking. I'd love to hear as you're leading you know, this global team, I'd love to hear any trends that you're noticing in the workplace today that really can help inform leaders about how they need to think differently or be think differently in the future. Well, uh, certainly thank you for that uh, compliment. I always feel like I'm running um, miles behind um, <laughs> everything. Um, I think, you know, um, a couple of the trends that are out there are probably trends that have been out there for a while, but just kind of get recycled. And the first of those is, um, you know, uh, we're continuously asked to to move faster, to innovate quicker, um, and to do that with less resources. Um, and sometimes those resources are not because co companies want to spend less money. It is just um, the ability for us, particularly in the software world, to find the people to do them. Um, and um, it's a it's a scarce skill. So oftentimes we have to innovate and and move quicker to support a new business effort with fewer resources because we just can't find the people. And that's a that is a trend that just continues to get harder and harder and harder every year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other trend that we certainly see at the moment is um, the complexity of the world at the moment. Um, so. Um, for various reasons, you know, there are new trade deals and um, old trade deals and um, different uh, po politics all over the place. And all of that makes it very hard to plan uh, what's going forward. And, and so it's a very unstable, unstable uh, planning environment as well, much more so than, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. We have um, a number of different uh, clients from manufacturing to retail who are dramatically impacted by the inability to plan in this current environment of trade deals and trade wars and everything else that's going on. I'd love to maybe touch on both of those trends that you're talking about. The first one is you know, the need to move faster with limited resources. It's hard to find people. How do you as a global leader 
deal with that, uh, with that trend, with that constraint, with that, with that challenge? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough problem to solve because everywhere in every country that we operate in, um, there are not enough people to do the work that we would, uh, mm that we would like. So um, I think a few years ago, you could shift work to a different geography and, um, and say, okay, there's a bandwidth there that we don't have, uh, particularly in the US, but that's no longer the case. And so um, we really um, are focused I'm really focused on making sure that people are working on the right things as efficiently as possible. But most of my time now is spent in just breaking down different cultures and different expectations that each of our, our, our regions have so that they can have that trust. Because I do believe uh, that with trust, um, uh, the ability to move work through the process faster exists, and um, and creating trust in in wide wide geographies is a true challenge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, creating trust when you've got an intact team located in one location is a challenge enough, and it's certainly a core component that we believe is critical to a team being effective. How do you do it across a global organization? And, and if I recall, you've got team members in Eastern and Western Europe. You've got team members in India. You've got team members in China. Have you, have you come across any tips or tricks or techniques that you use to try to establish that trust? Well, I experiment a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I know some things that may not work uh, as well, but um um, I think one of the things that we're experimenting with at the moment that seems to have some promise is um, in most traditional organizations, it feels like the management um, is also regional. Um, so you have a team in Switzerland, for example, and they have a Swiss manager or a team in Romania and they have a Romanian manager. Um, we're really trying to shake that up quite a bit and make sure that our managers have responsibilities in more than one geography. Mm. Um, and what that's causing is for people to rethink how they communicate um, and have meetings. And and so now you have to get really good at having remote meetings and you can't necessarily make a decision in the hallway and not communicate that. Um, and that has proven to really be a challenge for a lot of our, our managers, but a good challenge. Um, and um, it's been very enlightening to see some of the ways that they've worked around time zone differences and um, and the ability to just have those ad hoc um, electronic meetings that um, we're all supposed to be able to do so well. Right. What's a what's a tangible learning that you've had? either around the way that you run your remote meetings or, or have those interactions with those geographical differences that have worked? So first and foremost, I am a big believer that if anyone is in a meeting, um, they should know one, why they're there, but they should speak up. So one tangible thing we do on almost all of our electronic meetings is if you're on it, you speak. Um, it could just be that you say, hey, I agree with everything um, or um, or I don't. But it could also be that um, you get asked a question, you know, that you may not be the perceived expert on and, and you kind of have to stammer through that. Um, I just I think it's really helped us get diversity of thought, um, but it's really I, it's really helped build trust across the, the team members. Yeah, and it's so easy to uh, to be on a remote conference call or video line and be checking email or multitasking or doing other things in, as opposed to being engaged with, with your team. You said something. The, uh, the other tangible yeah. thing that I would add on to that, if I could real quick, Please. is we, we do that in random order. So, um, oh, interesting. Um, so you kind of have to pay attention because at any point in time, you could be the random person that's called on. And who does the calling? Is it you or is it somebody else on the team? It's anyone who's facilitating the meeting. So Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You mentioned something earlier. You used the word experiment. And you said you experiment a lot. And what, what I thought about was 
really it's a, to me that's about thinking and, and how leaders have to think differently tell me more about just this idea or the concept of experimenting what does it mean for you and why is that important for for leadership leaders to be experimenting in how they operate well i've i've really lately um kind of a personal trend for me i've really gotten um uh, very interested in uh, this whole topic of fear of failure um mm. And um, I've been reading a couple books on it uh, uh, lately. Um, just recently, the one by Jeremy Bloom, yeah. um, Fueled by Failure. And the reason I've become very interested in that is because um, nobody wants to fail. But we know that almost all of the great inventions of the world and all of the leapfrogs in, in, in human evolution of, of our inventions um, have come through failure. And um, if we're afraid to do it, but we know that that's what advances us as a, as a society or as a person, um, we've got to make sure that we make that comfortable. And leaders in particular um, don't like to fail. Um, I think they, um, um, we have an innate fear of, of, of that with our peers. And yet our teams are not going to be comfortable with failing if they don't see us failing. And so, um, so I've, you know, certainly since the beginning of the year, been sending out some articles to, to all of my team members around the world um, on this topic of fear of failure. And one of the things that struck me is I send out a lot of, of management like articles to, to my teams to read. Um, this has been the most respond, responded to. Um, Interesting. And maybe it's because it's the first of the year and people reset their goals and set their, you know, their, their personal goals. Yeah. But um, it could also be that, you know, as we're being pressured to innovate and move faster, people need to have that feeling that I can go do that. I can move really quick, but somebody should have me if I, if I fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's so many places we can go even within that alone. Um, and I think so many of the, so many of the challenges, you mentioned complexity earlier, so many of the challenges that we have to deal with as leaders today, they haven't been solved for before or in the past. And, and there has to be this mentality of the ability to experiment or fail forward or fail because in a way, failing is really just learning. It's learning about something that isn't going to work, which gets us closer to a better solution. So part of what I think you said your leaders need to see is you as a leader failing. How else do you also create an environment where people can fail safely, if you will? Well, I, I'm a big believer that you have to start. So when we have a fear of failure, we just don't start. And there's a little yeah. bit of, of paralysis there. And, um, and so I have to make it very comfortable for someone to take that first step. And, yeah. um, and be supportive of it. Oftentimes, it's not the step I would take. Um, um, and that's where, um, you know, I, I believe that there's a huge difference between being a good manager and being a good leader. You know, a leader says, I'm here, I'm here to coach you and help you, but you take the step, uh, where a manager might say, here's the step you should take and follow these steps to yeah. get there. Yeah. And, um, and it's real important, I think, for having people feel comfortable, uh, to be the leader and not the manager. Mm. That's fascinating. It's so part of what we see in our work is leaders who have a very patriarchal mindset, or there's only a few leaders at the top that basically control an entire organization, four, five, 600 people, a thousand people. And it's not really a way to innovate, to invent, to scale a business effectively. And part of what I, what, what I heard you say is You've got to you've got to give people that opportunity to fail, even if it's that first small step isn't how you might take it as as a leader yourself. I constantly remind the team that I fail every day, um, mm -hmm. um, and um, and I and I think you know there's different level levels of failure, but but you've got to push the envelope, and sometimes you know the envelope pushes back, and sometimes you pop right through it. So yeah, fun. Tied to this, you're building global teams, which is just incredible and it's challenging and it's difficult and it's rewarding. And I think as our world, our business, our workplace evolves, we're going to see more and more 
networked global organizations is just going to be part of part of the norm. I recently read an article by the Gartner Group talking about gender and diversity and inclusiveness. They said gender diverse and inclusive teams, I'm sorry, gender diverse and inclusive teams outperformed gender homogeneous, less inclusive teams by 50% on average. What's your take on both gender diverse and just diverse teams in general? What have you noticed? How do you try to create diverse teams, more inclusive teams in your organization? You know, Sal, that's a that's a great question. The um, in October, um, I had all of my management team of there's probably 18 managers plus or minus. Um, we met in Bonn, Germany, uh, and um, we spent an afternoon talking about how to make our teams um, more. Um, friendly to women because in the software world um, and, and in a lot of tech, tech industries, um, it's not as friendly to, to women as, as one might think. Um, and um, it was fascinating as we got into the research, you know, there's, there's certain things like um, the way men and women read a job, um, a job ad or a, um, a requisition um, where most men will say, well, I, I can uh, basically do five of those 10. So I'm good enough. I'm going to apply. And women may read that and say, well, I can only do five of 10. And so I won't apply. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole bunch of research where you can actually, by doing simple things like writing um gender friendly um, uh, job requisitions um, can can actually open up 50% of the workforce, right? It could be that women are not in the workforce uh, in the same numbers, but it could be that they self-select out because they feel that they can't um, do the job because of just a general difference in, in you know, the way they interpret the job ad. So, um, there's a lot that I think uh, we can do when we take a step back. It is absolutely true. The more diverse my, my teams are, the better off they perform. Um, and, um, and we see that uh, because even on management teams where there's diversity, um, it's that thought and the, and the insights and the experiences um, that make the, the overall decision better. And when they're more diverse, you just get a better decision out of it all. Yeah. And if we really want to lead organizations that are innovative and, and think differently, people have to have different perspectives, uh, different ways of seeing the world, different ideas. And I think as leaders, we have to create an environment where we can have those different perspectives and an understanding of each other um, so that there's trust and people can bring out those different ideas and, and perspectives and, and opinions. We, we live in a multitasking world, and I know that uh, when everything is a priority, nothing's a priority at all. How do you help create focus on your global team and, and what will leaders need to do or think differently around how they create focus in the future? Well, I'm a big believer in uh, the Agile methodology and, and particularly um, the Scrum framework within that. Um, but, um, you know, I think even when you subscribe to a, to a methodology, one, you have to make it fit um, the culture of the environments that you're working in. And two, you also have to um, take it with a grain of salt. Um, all of those frameworks adjust over time and um, and it's a, it's a continuous learning exercise, um, that never, you never really should plateau, um, in, in any of this. Um, but I think, you know, at the core of all of it, everybody's trying to solve the same problem. And the easiest, most simplest thing that I tell my teams is we're taught to think big and, and I, and I, and I want people to think big and dream big and come up with the big ideas, but you need to separate the ideas from the execution of those ideas. The execution of those ideas really only happens when you think small. And, and, and so I'm 
constantly pushing the teams to think small um, and and break down their work. Um, because w- with that breakdown of work, um, we just get better conversations. Uh, we get better definition of what the work is. And when we have that better definition of the work, then the focus just comes with it. Um, yeah. and, and along with that is learning to say no. Um, the, you know, the biggest um, challenge I think in the corporate world is, is saying no, um, partly because most people in the corporate world have a fear of missing out. I'm missing something mm. if I, if I say no, um, if I don't go to that meeting, I'm missing something. Right. Um, or why wasn't I invited, you know, um, to that offsite. But um, if you can let go of that fear of missing out um, and say no to a few things, um, I'm a big believer that um, people, people's accomplishments and their and 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 their wins um, speak for themselves. And and so, I'm not perfect at it. You know, I certainly end up with my own personal fear of missing out every once in a while. But um, if I take a step back and say, let me focus on what I need to focus on and get it done, um, that typically um, moves the process along much better. That's a, I've heard fear of missing out in terms of like, you know, social life and social events and how do you make choices personally, but as it relates to the workplace, it's, it's really fascinating, right? People get double or triple booked for meetings for no real good reason, except for maybe their ego or because they want to feel like they're part of something when in fact, that may not create leverage that becomes critical uh, in a team or a business. Tell me more about what you like, what you find attractive about the Agile methodology, knowing that that will change over time or there'll be a new version of that framework at some point in the future. But how does the Agile methodology in software development, how can, what can we take from, from that thinking as leaders to be more effective in the future? I think, you know, and, and there's a, a lot of examples now of the Agile methodology being applied in finance um, you know, some elementary schools use it, um, mm-hmm. and um, and it's really become a, a lot more about a, a, a thinking framework. Um, yeah. I think as time has gone on, but what I really like about it um, is I like that it is it's time boxed. So you're 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 you know in, in the software world we typically work in in two week time boxes, um, and what we do is is we say. I would like to accomplish these tasks by the end of this two week period. And to do that, I'm going to check in every day. Um, and if I'm off track, I'm going to decide what to do about that. I'm going to highlight that up and say, I can't go forward with it, or uh, I'm going to set it aside and come back to it, or, or I'm going to dive in and, and finish it. Um, and at the end of the two weeks, I'm going to show you what I did. And it may not be done and it may not be perfect, but I'm going to show you what it, what it, uh, what I accomplished. And that really, I think, gets to the human need of, of understanding what our work is, when understanding how we can be successful, but then also showing somebody and getting some recognition or getting some feedback that I'm on track or I'm off track with it. Mm. And um, the conversations and the collaborations that happen through that are just so much stronger than any other framework uh, that I've ever seen um, partly because I think Agile was really developed um, with a lot of psychology behind it, you know, where some other ways of doing work were just processes. They didn't really take into the way people th- think. Mm, it's a great, great perspective. What are some of the ways in which people think that, that have been taken into consideration? So we're moving beyond just a process actually considering the way people think, the way they interact with, with others, sort of the psychology, maybe even behind human needs. W- what are some examples of that? Well, I think, um, I think we all have a need or a want to help others and to teach others and to show others. Um, and so one of the things that I really like for my folks to do is um, if they think that they know it, they need to uh, show others or help others who may not yeah. know that. Um, and then I'm constantly in meetings um, reminding folks that every time they step and they talk over somebody, um, they're actually shutting down um, an entire 
branch of the tree, so to speak, um, a, a, another input that could come in. And so in this methodology, you know, people have the opportunity to, to share what they know, to help each other. The, it's about evaluating the capacity of the team over the individual. Um, and it's, you know, we ask some of our some of our teams to rotate the roles, um, and some people do it better than others. But everybody learns, and they they can say, "Hey, I see you're struggling with this. Here's something that I did that that helped with that." And so, um, I honestly believe that my number one job in in everything that I do is growing the people that are in my organization. Mm. So, my job is to give them the skills. Um, to be successful wherever they go. And that doesn't necessarily mean they stay on any of the teams that, that I manage or even in the organization. Yeah. But if I can help them be successful and give them the confidence around that, then they'll turn around and do that with the people that they're working with. And hopefully that gets contagious and everybody is kind of saying, hey, my success it's really dependent upon everybody else's success. So it's in the interest of everyone to exchange information and to and to grow as a as a unit versus grow as an individual. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean I think it's just so fascinating how that methodology really brings out that peer peer collaboration, the importance of the communication, the, the the daily checking in with each other. It all feeds into um, some of those human needs the the human need to be part of something, the human need to. Uh, be able to help others to sh to share your ideas and your expertise, and so the people development side becomes more important. And even the the Scrum Alliance, um, um, which is also based here in Colorado, um, has a, on their website um, has a wealth of information on management topics um, as it relates to to kind of the agile methodology, um, right. because. As as uh, as the methodology has grown over time, um, there's there's a real uh, understanding that um, it doesn't live in a bubble, right? It lives in right. a, in uh, a much bigger um, um, picture, and and. and understanding the management impacts or how companies make funding decisions and helping um, senior management be more comfortable with what it, the definition of a deadline is or everything right. plays into the effectiveness of this. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is a lot, of, there's a wealth of management um, uh, webinars and, um, and materials now on the Scrum Alliance website. Thanks for sharing that, Vaughn. It sounds like it's a pretty helpful resource. You mentioned uh, the, your number one job is really around growing, developing your people. How do leaders need to be thinking about growing and developing your people? And you talked about goal setting and one-on-ones and things like that in some of our pre-conversations. What are some ways in which you develop people today that, that might inform leaders on, on how to grow people more effectively in the future? First, I think um, for all of us who are in a leadership role, we have to understand who the leaders are in our organization. And the leaders are not always the managers. Um, mm. And um, you can accomplish a lot um, by understanding who the leaders are and, and who the, the rest of the team members are looking up to. Um, and so anytime you're just communicating through your management structure, you're probably not being as effective in your communication as you could be. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, for me, I ask people to look at lateral moves as much as um, vertical moves, mm -hmm. um, because I think um, for all of us, my career uh, as well, um, it isn't that, you know, that, that, perfect uh, 45 degree angle on a, on a chart that we're all taught to believe that our, our career should progress on. Our, our careers progress much more stair-step. And um, some of the best things that I've done in my career have been because of a lateral move and not a, a vertical move. And so you have to, you have to get people comfortable that um, they should manage their career and they should do what they want to do um, and not what society or others want them to do. Um, mm. and, and that sounds really basic and really easy, but it's really, really, um, it's really hard for most of us to, to make that, that leap. 
Yeah, it, it really is. Part of the work that we do in executive coaching is, is helping people reframe the assumptions and beliefs that they have about themselves that, that are largely driven by other people's expectations. They're largely driven by the need that somebody else has for, for that person, as opposed to being the architect of your own life, of your own career, and defining what expectations and beliefs that you have for, your, for yourself. I'm constantly borrowing some of the materials from our from our past, Al, because uh, I, you know, that's the one takeaway um, from some of the work you and I've done in the past that um, mm-hmm. has has really uh, resonated in in uh, my beliefs going forward. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too because I think it speaks in many ways to the level of maturity that a leader has when we start operating from our own internal set of beliefs versus because we're trying to get be externally validated by somebody else, we start operating more from a place of purpose, of service, of vision. We start thinking more systemically about what the business of the organization needs versus what my own ego or my own agenda is. So it, it really reframes the place that leaders start from and, and become more effective from. All right, you mentioned one thing I want to explore in, here in a little bit more depth we shouldn't always look toward the people that are there that are managers that are sort of officially in those managers ro- roles, but toward the leaders. And, and those are people that we look up to and we should also communicate through them. How do you do that? How do you do that without undermining people that are maybe in those more formal management positions? Well, I think, you know, I try to be very visible and open with with uh, my management team. And so yeah. if I'm going to do that, um, they typically know that that I'm going to do that. Um, this meeting that I talked about in October in, in Bonn, Germany, um, we also it was it was the managers, but we also invited five uh, people from the team that were not managers, um, yeah. and they participated just like um, they were managers. They got to hear the same issues that we were working on, um, and they got to see kind of the inner workings of it all. And it's not because they're on the management track. I think I think we do a good job, uh, oftentimes, of bringing the next round of managers um, yeah. along, and so we we show them, um, you know, kind of what it's like, and and kind of groom them. But none of these uh, folks uh, want to be in management. Um, uh, and and so it was a, an interesting experiment to just bring um, some folks that were were not. I mean, they're they're not necessarily on that track. Uh, all of them, some of them, yeah. uh, probably are. But, um, but I think you have to put situations out there and um, tasks and projects out there that um, the that some of these folks can um, uh, pick up uh, for you, and then everybody gets to see that. Um, and, uh, and, and at any point in time, we all have a million little things that we can, I think, hand off to one of these folks and say, Hey, you know, it would be great if you pulled together a focus group, um, and you guys gave us your opinion on this uh, topic, for example. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because you're, you're developing like this networked approach maybe toward, toward leading change where, then these folks can, they're not officially managers, but they can still be leaders and, and they can still be ambassadors for what you're trying to, to, to help people with or how you're trying to navigate people through change. Uh, I think that's a really interesting philosophy and, and a way of even pushing decision making down further into the organization. And I think companies are, are seeing that too. You know, there are tracks now in a lot of companies that don't require um, people to go through the management ranks to excel at their career. And, and that's really important. And particularly for us, we, you know, we buy a lot of companies and smaller companies, if you're a really good coder, then all of a sudden you have seven coders working for you. And, and, and you may not be a really great manager because you were, you really wanted to be a coder, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, But through, you know, evolution of, of size and, and everything you, you fell into management. So, um, so I think it is about, you know, really wrestling with what it is you want to do and um, looking at some other options 
that may not be on the management track. Mm-hmm. I wonder if organizations are missing out on the development of these people. So it's not uncommon to have leadership development programs for people that are on the management track. But I, you know, I wonder if we're missing that the entire group of leaders or a subset of leaders that who aren't on the management track but are still in leadership roles. I, I think I think there is a huge gap there, to be honest. Um, it would be interesting if there was a program out there that didn't allow a manager to apply for it, right? Or be mm-hmm. uh, that the, the class itself was not open to managers. It was open to other leaders within, within a, a company. Um, yeah. And it would probably take on a different, a different spin. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Fawn, this has been uh, incredibly insightful, uh, incredibly helpful. Your perspective is always enlightening. Thanks for being on the show today, and I look forward to to hearing more from you in the future. Well, thanks for the invite, and uh, good luck with the series. Great. Thanks, Fawn. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Sal Sylvester on the Future of Leadership podcast. You can get session notes on our website at 512solutions.com. That's the numbers 512solutions.com. Please follow and like the podcast on iTunes or wherever you're tuning in. And if you want to learn more about how we can help transform your people into confident and action-oriented leaders, please check out our website at 512solutions.com. I look forward to continuing the conversation about the future of leadership. I'm out.